Welcome back to the Superheroes Everyday Podcast. I'm Danny Horn. I'm here with Trevor Bolliger. Hello, Trevor. Hey, what's going on? Long time no talk. Here we are for Act 3 of the 2011 prequel, X-Men First Class. If you can't remember Act 2, this is what happened then. Why do you think all the fish disappearing is a bonus for you? How does that help you in any way? I would like to suggest that if your good friend is a telepath, that you should not play chess against them. This is the kind of scene where it's obvious that each character has been individually dropped into the room by helicopter. Just the look of dismay that she gives the the colonel, like she might as well be giving that to the, the director of this movie of just the, like, come on. And now Eric can do anything he wants. So Nazi coins, watch the fuck out. Eric coming for you. All right, and here we are in Act 3 of X-Men First Class. Tensions mount, and we can tell because there's a very helpful news voice at this point saying, tensions mount as the Soviet missile ship nears Cuba. And then they start talking about panic buying and grocery store shelves, which is a little bit not entirely the point. But there is Angel and Sebastian Shaw on their submarine watching TV and being very smug. It really did not take Angel very long to agree that starting thermonuclear war is an amazing idea. It is possible that Charles did not pick actually the best possible people for this mission. I have a question. So they're on a submarine underwater in the Arctic Circle, and they have crystal clear television. (laughs) That's true. I think that's the most unbelievable part about this whole movie. Yeah. Yeah, that's the fantasy. Thinking about this movie... They cast Kevin Bacon, which is like, he's the big, he's the big star. So this is before right. Fassbender and McVoy became household names. Nobody knew who they were. Right. Um, this is, yeah. Jennifer Lawrence just won the Academy Award for Winter's Bone, a movie that nobody saw. It's also the year before Hunger Games, which is a movie that everybody saw. Right. So Kevin Bacon is like the name that's going to get people into theaters. Yes. We used to play a fun game way back when called... You know, seven degrees of separation. Six degrees of of Kevin Bacon, yeah. Is it six degrees? Yeah. Oof. See, that's it's been so long. (laughs) That's how bad you were at it. And I think there's just such an interesting like phenomenon of like that was a game pretty much until the Avengers happened. Like the MCU, especially Endgame and Infinity War, like completely destroyed that game. Yeah, because now every actor has has been in a Marvel or a DC movie. Yeah, it's like the one degree of the MCU. Yeah, yeah, you're exactly right. Hank has a present for Raven, which he brings to her in her enormous mansion bedroom at the Xavier place, where he's got a little magic potion where he's isolated something, and they're going to take this potion, and it won't affect their ability. This is odd to me. He says it won't affect their abilities. It'll just affect their appearance, even though for both of them, the appearance is their ability. Yeah, it makes no fucking sense. I don't want to feel like a freak all the time. I just want to look normal. Yeah, just what every girl wants, a serum. (laughs) This is definitely the equivalent of buying your partner a Peloton for their birthday. Oh, yeah. It's not a good look. Not a good look, Hank. She is starting to feel like maybe this is not the right way to go. And so she's telling Hank, you are beautiful and perfect. You know, just the way you are, Hank. Pretty Nicholas Holt. Which is all very nice, but like... She's currently pretty Jennifer Lawrence. She was being pretty Jennifer Lawrence before he came into the room. So she's hanging out like that. The film is telling us that the blue body is the real one, but they put her in human form in practically every scene because it's Jennifer Lawrence and they don't, they want you to look at her. Also, the blue body is so expensive for them to do. Yes. It took her like literally seven hours of makeup. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. Just be head to toe in that. So unfortunately, like that, I feel like kind of counters a little bit the message of what they're doing. But he is saying, my feet and your natural blue form will never be deemed beautiful. We need this cure. And I was thinking, dude, nobody can see your feet. Wear shoes like you do. You're currently wearing shoes. Everybody wears shoes all the time. Why are you so torn up about this? It is possible that three quarters of the people that I know have fingers for fingers for feet as far. I, I wouldn't know. I haven't I don't see that many people with their with their shoes off in my normal course of events. I'm really afraid right now because podcasts are audio mediums. <laughs> and I bet 
the audience right now is just assuming that we all have free that you have right yeah that you that is true i'm sorry i'm sorry that i outed you i didn't ask you didn't tell but it is true trevor does have trevor does have uh think and the the worst part of it all is i don't even look remotely as handsome as nicholas holt I, nobody does nobody you does know. i'm only human i know but people fear what they don't understand. Shaw is endearing us all. Eric and Charles are getting together to discuss Shaw. And Eric is saying Shaw is endangering us all. I'm planning to kill him. Is that cool with you? And Charles is like, oh, I'd rather I'd rather you didn't. Eric says tomorrow mankind is going to know about us. They will fear us. And that fear will turn to hatred. Because humans fear what they don't understand. Now... Trevor, you have not yet heard the first episode of this podcast, but it is possible that the audience did. We talked about Man of Steel in the previous episode, and that was that's a huge theme of Man of Steel, is that people are afraid of what they don't understand, which is not actually true. People, when they see something that, that they don't understand, we try to understand it. People experience things that, they, that they've never seen before with curiosity and wonder. We're afraid of things that are dangerous and terrifying and you haven't given us a heads up that you exist. Like if they told everybody, Hey everybody, we're mutants and we're here and we can, and like we can do some weird things, but everything's fine. People would probably be kind of okay. Instead, like you fuck around and you do reckless and unpredictable things during literally one of the most perilous moments in human history. This is not a don't understand kind of situation. They do understand. And that's why they're scared of you. Because you're scary. Like, you're actually scary. Charles is saying we can be better men. And Eric says we already are. Because we are the next stage of human evolution. So here's where, really, you're starting to get this question of, like, are we actually pro-Nazis on the in this movie? Well, one of them is. Yeah. Hank goes blue at that point. Hank injects himself. It does not go that well. It's unclear what it was actually supposed to do but now every now he's blue and that's the thing that happens to hank raven shows up in eric's bed eric says you are too young for me to have sex with maybe a few years from now i will have sex with you then i mean chivalry is not dead <laughs> that's what you say to girls that's what you say to young women who appear in your in your bedroom is you just say hey in a few years just put that on your calendar and we'll, yeah we'll talk about it then what a good night for her she gets gifted a serum yeah. Eric calls her a creature. <laughs> He's an exquisite creature. She goes to Charles and she's just blue and naked. And he sees her and he's like, ah, go put some clothes on. He is so naked. And this she's is super, the, like, super naked. This is the seven hour, very expensive makeup procedure yeah. for her. And I, yeah, even if you're blue, you're still naked. The Cuban Missile Crisis was in October. So this yeah. is October in upstate New York. She is got to be <laughs> chilly to some degree. So like wear a sweater or. Yeah. She says like, I thought we wanted it to be you and me against the world, but you don't want to be against the world. And it's just like, yeah, but clothes though, usually preferable. I've said this a million times, but this movie is so horny. It really is. I know they really, they just want all the girls to be as naked as they possibly can. Mm -hmm. They get Jennifer Lawrence practically naked. Like, yeah, or at least some kind of some kind of equivalent. Next morning, we're all ready to go and screw up history. They go to Hank's office. It is trashed. He says he'll meet them at he leaves a note that says he'll meet them at the airbase. And uh, by the way, I left you a whole bunch of costumes because Hank is the only useful member of this team. He's the only person who does anything useful at all. Would you want to see the costumes that Banshee made? <laughs> yeah, no, but, yeah, all of them secretly. This is a whole secret Santa thing of like each of them secretly made a whole suite of costumes for each other. Um, but Hank's were the good ones. We did just talk about how Jennifer Lawrence was buck ass naked in the previous scene. In this yes. scene, she is wearing like a turtleneck <laughs> and a leather coat. She is she couldn't be wearing more clothes if she tried. <laughs> yes, she's got a muck look on. They show up at the airbase. Now they all have costumes and they are standing in a straight line like they're reporting for duty to nobody. And then there's a big reveal where there's a silhouette of Hank walking towards them. And then you see him and he's all blue and fuzzy and he looks very cute and he's still wearing glasses. He looks he's so fuzzy. He's somewhat like I kind of want to just kiss him on the cheek. 
I know he's such a cutie. Yeah. Yeah. Even even as a blue monster named Beast, it's like, no. Yeah. So everybody's happy with him. Eric says he never looked better, and Hank thinks he's being sarcastic and chokes him. And that's about as far as things go for Hank, as far as Hank's story arc. It is finished. Ship stuff. There's going to be a lot of ship stuff from here on. There's about 35 minutes left in this movie, and a lot of it is ship people doing ship things. Some of them are American. Some of them are Russian. I didn't bother to really keep track, and it did not seem to impair my enjoyment of the film at all. There's ship stuff happening. They're somewhere. They're off the coast of Cuba somehow, somewhere. I'm not sure where they are. One specific ship is getting close to the the Americans' embargo line, and the Russians are telling that ship to turn back, and they're not, and they're not doing it. It's the one boat that has the nuclear warheads. Wait, is it? Does that boat have the nuclear warheads? Because bad things are going to happen to that boat, and it's not a good idea to do that to the boat that has the nuclear warheads on it. I watched Chernobyl, so I'm somewhat an expert <laughs> in this, but it's. <laughs> No, they're not like there's a thing about they have to be armed for them to actually be nuclear, but otherwise it's fine. And so it's. Is that true? There's an iota of truth to that, but I'm not going to win any games of Jeopardy with that knowledge. And then there's Hank and now kind of set against all of the ship stuff. There's also some plane stuff because here's Hank's supersonic jet and all the X-Men are on it. They're flying around and Charles is thinking real hard about that boat that's getting close to the line and he realizes that Azazel has been there and killed everybody and just set it to cross the line and if that ship crosses the line our boys are going to blow it up and the war begins. There are two fantastic outfit moments that just happened. So it shows all of the the United States army men and then all the Russian army men yeah. and they call for battle stations and they all like change their little army outfits their, their naval oh, outfits. They? Yeah, they, Aww. I mean, they love their outfits and they put on their life preservers. <laughs> they kind of do it in unison. It's very cute. It reminds me of the Boy Scouts. <laughs> Azazel on the bridge of the warhead ship. Oh, he's wearing a little, he's wearing a little, he's wearing a little captain's hat. That's my absolute favorite part of the movie. Oh, I'd forgotten all about that. You're right. And he is smiling. He is having the time of his life. If he was not born uh, like a weird mutant. He would be just like captaining a tugboat, just having the. the he just loves dressing possible. up. He, you know what it is? He likes dressing up in dead people's clothes. Azazel is kind of a happy-go-lucky dude. I don't feel like does he have any lines? I feel like Azazel and Riptide, neither of them has a single actual live dialogue. Azazel definitely has a few. What does he say? It's no, he, he definitely has a couple, but it's... I can't, I can't think of a single thing that he that he says. He's just fun. Azazel, this whole movie should be honestly should be about him. You know, if you removed 80% of the characters, this movie would have just been... Like, this movie is just over two hours long. If it were a tight 90 and they really just aggressively cut out everything that wasn't great, it would have been the greatest superhero movie of all time. Yeah. Cuban Missile Crisis is happening, all these, all this ship stuff. Apparently, nobody notices the sudden appearance of a completely unknown aircraft, like, zooming around up in the sky. Literally, nobody mentions it. The Russians are trying to explain. They're telling the Americans, we have lost control of this cargo ship. And the Americans say, it's a ruse. Stand by to fire. Then Charles, in the plane, takes control of a human adult male and makes him go over to the control panel and shoot a missile to blow up the cargo ship that has the nuclear warheads on it, which means that the Russians fired on their own ship which, according to this movie, helped. Helped everyone to come. It, it, in my opinion, it adds more recklessness and unpredictability to this unbelievably tense situation. But they all seem to feel like, oh, well, as long as they fired them on their own ship, then I guess that's cool. Again, it's been decades since I learned about this in school. And so, like, maybe that's actually how it happened. Uh, see, the thing I know... There's I there's also, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a, an expert on the Cuban Missile Crisis. One thing that I do actually know, it was not handled by random people on boats. The way that they actually it was diplomacy, obviously, between Kennedy and Khrushchev discussing things with each other. In this movie, people are making all kinds of decisions on these boats and they're they have no interest at all in relaying that information back to Washington or Moscow. They are just, as far as they're concerned, they are handling it entirely on their own. Yeah. And the, so the very next scene or, or shot is like Kevin Bacon 
as Shaw being so surprised, just flabbergasted that this like watertight plan did not work. <laughs> it's not, it's not coming together. It's not happening. But his plan is based on so many assumptions. And the biggest is that everybody involved is just going to be so complacent that yeah. World War Three is going to happen. It's just going to happen. Yeah, right. Nobody, nobody really has any kind of interest, self-interest in in maybe ha- making that not happen. There's all these boats, but the the real action is happening between the plane and the submarine. And so this is my thing. It's just like none of these. Why are we having? Why is the whole last third of the movie take place in the ocean? It's just the least convenient place for all of these characters to interact with each other. They need to find on the plane. They need to figure out where the submarine is for some reason. I don't know why. And they're worried because they don't have any sonar. And Banshee's like, yeah, we do. And now here's Banshee's moment to be to pretend that he's going to be useful. So they just kind of like drop him in the water and hope for the best. And he just decides that that now his scream is is sonar. And he just kind of invents that. I just call me old fashioned, but I appreciate just a little bit of physics in my movies. Like, <laughs> like if he's supposed to have like a voice that can create. He now can hear that bouncing back. Yeah. It's just a thing you can do. Yeah. Okay. Like, I'll believe it. Like, the, so the thing, is, the thing like... is, like, here they all are out on the sea where none of their powers are useful and they're just trying. I mean, Angel is, is flying around on little dragonfly wings and spitting acid at people. This is not, this is not a power set that's going to help you very much in the Cuban Missile Crisis, but no. they're working with what they got. I mean, do you think it's all set at sea because the average American just believes that Cuba is just the sea, just coastline? (laughs) So if they showed like a city or anything? This is actually, well, this is going to come up. Yeah, this is going to come up that when they all end up in a minute. I'll, I'll discuss this in a second. Now we get the doomed romance on the high seas. They've got Shaw's location, thanks to Banshee and his sonar. Charles and Eric are going to do something very, very important. I don't really understand what it is. There's a lots of music and close-ups and everything is very tense and people are pressing buttons and flipping switches. And Eric is like trying very hard to reach the submarine. And Charles is standing behind him and tells him like, remember the point between rage and serenity. And it's this sort of Charles and Eric final romance moment. No real sense of what the Americans and the Russians think is going on right now. Riptide decides to do something entirely useless, and he creates a tornado, a tiny tornado, which is not clear how that's supposed to help anybody. And then it's time for the hot summer beach party, where the submarine and the plane both crash on a nearby beach. Now, here's the question. And this beach is on what island is this that we're currently on? Is this Cuba? Cuba. That's Cuba. This is Cuba? (laughs) There's like... It's there. It's just a beach. It's this like completely empty tourist attraction mm-hmm. that has sight line on the embargo line, and here we are. Here we all are on the beach. There's no and there's no sense that like there's anything over the hill. Empty beach. No one comes to check. There's the Cuban yeah. Missile Crisis is happening right here. You would think that there would at least be some people with binoculars yeah. hang, hanging out on that hill. Nope, nobody's there. They crash the submarine. They crash the plane. Everybody survives and is fine. Obviously. And then the boys all try and fight. So Azazel is being cool. Um, he's being super fun. He like picks up Havoc and picks up Beast and like teleports them up into the sky above the sea. And he's going to drop them. And Beast like puts his claws into Azazel and says like, if we go, you go. Which I don't think is how teleporting works. Like I think the whole point is he could just teleport. It doesn't matter if you're pretending to hold on to him. I don't get it. No, I think, yeah, they've shown it a couple times, but it's definitely very, like, convenient to whatever... We've just decided, yeah. ...the writers want. But it's a nice time, and then and then they, like, drop onto a uh, a ship, and now they're fighting on the ship. Eric gets into the sub, which has the nuclear reactor. Mm-hmm. Shaw mm-hmm. is, like, soaking up nuclearness. It's all just, like, fight, fight, fight. Soldiers are pointing guns, Havoc, and then Angel's there, and she's flying and spitting, and then Banshee attacks Angel, and everybody, now just everybody's fighting everybody. Yeah, watching this, you know, I, I my, my brain just kind of broke it out into the three teams, and there's like the A-team, which is like Eric and Charles going after Sean, like, right. 
That's great. Again, like the yeah. movie should have just been that. Mm-hmm. And the B team is Azazel, Raven, and Beast, where it's like yeah. the actors are good. This, this right. characters actually have arcs. Uh, the, the effects, they actually spend money on those effects. And so mm-hmm. like, it's also pretty good. It, it plays yeah. by the rules of physics and by the rules of the, of the movie. And then there's the C team, which is, you know, Havoc and Angel and yeah. Banshee just being just super silly and just like, yeah. come on, get this over with so I can go look at, you know. Right. Beast. Eric or whatever being and then yeah. there's the d team which is uh riptide who just gets knocked out in the <laughs> just, first like two seconds of them all fight. all on his own riptide is just yeah sorry dude <laughs> you bring nothing to the team and then raven actually has a moment so beast is fighting azazel and and then shaw is standing there on the beach telling azazel to stop but it turns out that's actually raven haha which is very cute and this is the only time I counted the number of times that Raven has actually used her powers in the movie to do a thing. And I counted all the way up to one. And this is it. They make a big deal about her and her powers. She does not use her powers at all. And and the whole rest of the movie, which is all fights. I'm like, dude, can you turn into somebody big and strong? No. She just stands there. What is the point of you and your shape-shifting? Yeah. I mean, I guess the, the story arc is that like Xavier has told her, like you have to hide. People won't accept you, and he's very like patriarchal to her. Of like he wants to protect her. He doesn't want her to be in danger. Uh, I mean, that's a, ultimately why she chooses to go with Eric because yeah, she's like call me old not. fashioned. Call me old fashioned. I feel like if it's a superhero movie, and one of the heroes that we're supposed to really care about has a mutant power, there should be some moment in the film where she uses that mutant power. But she did just here. And so once, that's actually but only once. But I think that's okay because it's quality over quantity. And I, I would think- I would like to see her. I would like to see her turn into the Hulk. This because this is the question is like, could she do that? Like, could she actually like turn into somebody who's big and has a big hand and can punch somebody with her big hand? I would have to imagine so based on the logic that they've shown in this. But but we don't I mean, really I, yeah, I mean we'll get to it in, in just a, a moment, my favorite yeah. moment. But like I think why this movie why i still like enjoy mm-hmm. this movie yeah. and still yeah. hold it in like a decently high regard despite all of its it is an enjoyable movie yeah is that there's some really powerful uses of their their mutations of their mm-hmm. abilities that really just like amplify their character journeys and so i mm-hmm. think that's mm-hmm. at the end of the day that's what's more interesting than just a bu- bunch of cg yeah. going yeah, yeah haywire and so like, yeah she only uses it once but it's to great effect it is a really nice moment. But that also, don't worry, like, in 2012, she becomes Katniss Everdeen, and so <laughs> right. the next She's, X-Men movie, yeah. she is, like, front and center on the poster. That is true. That is true. Eric finds Shaw in the nuclear room on the submarine, and Shaw does another seduction thing, which is what he does. Why are you on their side? Why fight for race that is coming for us? They have kind of, like, a metal fight, and he says, like, we're the future of the human race. And Eric says, what you did made me stronger. You made me the weapon I am today. You are my creator. But then he pulls the helmet off so that Charles can freeze Shaw. Then Eric says, I'm sorry, Charles. And he puts on the helmet because he doesn't trust Charles. And then he gives what is actually a very effective little speech, which is, if you're in there, I would like you to know I agree with every word you said. We are the future. But unfortunately, you killed my mother. And then he counts to three and he takes the coin and he pushes it very slowly through Sebastian Shaw's brain, which is great. I don't even have a joke. It's like this is a great way to to destroy him. He is suddenly we he has been untouchable because if you hit him really hard, he just absorbs it. And they found this really gorgeous way to say, well, he's not untouchable because I'm going really slow. I could push the coin all the way through his brain and then it falls down on the ground and it has blood and brain on it. And it's just great. It's just a really, really well-made scene. It's yeah. fucking cool. It's yeah. delightful to watch. It's like has an emotional satisfaction because mm-hmm. like, from the, the very beginning of the movie. And so like this yeah. story arc is why I remember this movie. This is why I chose this movie. All the other stuff around it, there's very silly and unreal things. And what they do with women is very weird. But yes, but, but when it comes to like Eric and Shaw and Charles. Yeah, and I love that. When the camera is panning through Kevin Bacon's head, you're, it's also simultaneously panning through James McAvoy's head, 
Yeah. Because James McAvoy is in Shaw's mind. And so you have right. to kind of imagine that he's yeah. like his he's being ripped apart. He he's sees what's going on. Yeah. Pain. Yeah. It's easier to see that what happens to to Kevin Bacon's mm-hmm. character because he crumples on the ground like a rag yeah, doll. But this also but this also really hurts hurts Charles as well. Yeah. And so it's yeah, it, it's effective. And it's not like a huge CG explosive submarine in the sky. It's just a small coin that it that you don't see for most it's of it. It's the smallest thing. Yeah. Yeah, it's just great. Yeah. This is the best thing in the movie. But don't you worry. The movie's not done with you yet. The movie's not dumb, done him fisting in more prequel origin story stuff. Oh no, that's coming and coming. Big important man meeting somewhere in the world where they decide to strike and take out the mutants, which at this point, I kind of agree with them. Like, it's time for these mutants to, to go. <laughs> They've been screwing up this whole time. Back to the surf and safari beach party. Eric brings Shaw's body out, floating in the air, and dumps him on the ground with a lot of, like, god music. And Eric now, Eric is Magneto. He says, take off your blinders. They're targeting us. Humans, united in their fear of the unknown. Which, it's like, dude, this is not about you being unknown. You have interfered recklessly in an international crisis with no explanation at all. So, it's really not that. Moira's trying to, like, call somebody, some important man somewhere, and she can't get through. All the Russians and Americans are like, okay, you know what? Fuck it. And so they all target the beach. They all fire at the same time, which is very impressive. And then there's a great image. Is, is doesn't This is another very effective moment. Dozens of missiles all heading for the beach. And then Eric just stops them in the air right before it reaches them, which is it's a great image. It's really, really good. I mean, I, I question they saw the submarine floating through the sky. So I, mean, I guess they didn't know that he can control metal, but it's they know that he's a freak. They don't know what's going on. They know that crazy shit has happened and it's these people. Yeah. Eric turns the missiles back on people and Charles is saying, no, 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 please don't kill them. They are people. Good, honest, innocent men. They're just following orders. And this is confusing to me. Eric says, I've been at the mercy of men just following orders. Never again. And I'm like, so wait, so who are the Nazis now? Wait, so we're saying the people on the boats are the Nazis? Like, I'm losing track of who's the Nazis and who isn't the Nazis right now. Yeah, I mean, everybody in slightly intolerant is a Nazi. I mean, it's... Yeah, this movie is very confused about who the Nazis are. I mean, if you use that rule of whoever, like in an argument, whoever calls the other person <laughs> a Nazi, they lose. Oh, that's then... true. Yeah, it's Godwin's. Yeah, Godwin's. According to Godwin's law, all of these people have this entire movie has lost mm. from the very first scene. Charles and Eric basically have a slap fight on the beach and the missiles kind of zoom and they sort of blow up and drop. Some of them drop and some of them are still pointed at things and kind of go back and forth with that. The other mutants are just standing there on the beach doing absolutely nothing while all this is going on. Nothing. Havoc, Riptide, Raven, Banshee, Angel. You want to throw in Angel anything? You could go and fly around if you want. I mean, what do you like? Their dads are fighting on the beach. I know. And they're all just kind of like standing in a line like it's a stage play. Except for Moira. Ta-da! Who comes. She shoots. She scores. She shoots and shoots and shoots at Magneto. And for one moment, instead of just like making the bullets just fall to the ground, he's making them ricochet in random directions. One of them ricochets and it goes straight through Charles. Charles drops to the ground and then all the missiles drop to the ground. That's over. Now this is about Charles and Eric. The boats basically at that moment, the boats basically just disappear and are no longer a factor in the film. Irrelevant. Yes. Irrelevant. They shot all their ammunition, so they have no purpose left to give. Yep, we don't even look at them anymore. They're fine. Off in the distance, there's international relations happening. But right now, the thing that matters is that Charles Xavier is bullet ridden on the beach. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm glad that this movie was brave enough to answer the question that we all had, mm-hmm. which is how did Professor X get in the wheelchair? Just yeah. the most interesting question. And, that and, right, and here we are. Yeah, so this, like you said, this is going to be like origin story, ahoy. Mm -hmm. Eric is standing over. So I have a problem with this, with this scene. I get very tense. There's two things in movies that make me very, very tense. One is when somebody has like a bag or a backpack and they leave it somewhere 
And then, and I'm like, wait, no, go back for your bag. Like that just really bothers me. If like somebody's in a car and they don't take their bag, it's, I can't pay attention to anything that's going on in the scene. Cause I'm like, wait, but you left your bag. The continuity just completely derails everything. No, it's just like, I get worried for people's stuff. Like I hate losing my stuff. And so it just, it upsets me. The other thing that upsets me is what happens here, which is somebody clearly desperately needs medical care that they aren't getting. It is so distracting. They do a huge, very long scene where Charles has a bullet in his gut and we're just going to keep doing a scene. Eric comes over he, he and he uses his little magic power to take the bullet out. And I'm like, no, 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 don't do that. That's not, that's an exit wound now. You didn't, that didn't make things better. Just taking the, plucking the bullet out is not a solution to this problem. Eric blames Moira. He's very mad at Moira. Azazel, at this point, could actually teleport him to a hospital, which would be helpful. But no. I didn't even think about that, but. I know. Yeah. No, they don't. But nice, you know, romantic. This is their breakup scene. Yeah, I thought you were going to say that there's two things that, you know, give you anxiety in a movie. And one is when uh, people leave their backpacks. The second is when two characters should kiss, but they don't kiss. <laughs> right, yes. Ever going to be a kiss in this movie. It was right then. Yeah, for sure. Eric says, you know, Charles, come with me. We want the same thing. And it's like, well, at the moment, what I want is medical attention. But no, we just hang around. He's He is grievously wounded, but he's still got lines for like another three pages. Eric says, us turning on each other, it's what they want. We are brothers, you and I. All of us together. It's great dialogue, though. All of us together, protecting each other. We want the same thing. And little James McAvoy, oh, my friend, I'm sorry. But we do not. It's beautiful. Moira comes over, starts fussing over Charles. And then Eric makes a speech to everybody. And they're all just, like, standing in line. And he says, who's with me? And he holds his hand out. And Raven walks towards him. And you have to admit she has a point. And Charles says, you should go with him. It's what you want. What he wants right now is an ER. This is still bothering me. Raven tells Moira to take care of him. And I'm like, yes, specifically take care of the wound, which they're not even looking for bandages. It just bothers me so much. Like they're doing, it's such good dialogue. This is the thing that's so funny for me. It's like, it's such good dialogue they're doing. It's, it's all the right story beats. And I'm like, but he's bleeding though. It just bothers me. It's definitely character shield because the audience knows that, oh, that's Professor X. He's going to be fine. Right. Yeah, yeah. They could have done a very interesting, but probably very obnoxious thing of Eric c- control the the iron in his blood and, and clot it. And <laughs> yeah, no. Maybe a little tiny, a little tornado could go and just yeah. kind of wisp it into a scab. <laughs> I don't know. Well, Eric and his crew now all just teleport away in a cloud of red smoke, leaving just havoc and Banshee and Beast. Just three completely useless dudes. Moira is kind of like dragging Charles around. She says, I'm going to get you to a hospital. And then she just kind of like tries to pick him up and just drag him along. And I'm like, I have I have several important questions. Question number one, where is the hospital that you're going to get him to? You don't even know where you are. And if there's a town near where you are right now then that should probably have been a consideration this whole time like are you in the bahamas i I then went and looked on a map and i'm like well so what's near cuba it's all tourist attractions it's like you're in the bahamas there's a hotel on this beach somewhere i mean ian fleming's estate is not too far away from that yeah where's ian and he's and in 62 he's he's there writing novels that are terrible about women he would fit right into this movie yeah he'd fit this movie right down to the ground (laughs) Charles can't feel his legs, and there's a big crane shot. Really, the only thing that matters is that is that the lead character's having a hard day. President Kennedy makes a speech, says everything is fine. So that's good. We handled all that. And then there's another unbelievable helicopter scene where Moira is pushing Charles in a wheelchair around the mansion. And if you try and think for a second about how they got from wherever they are on the beach, back to Westchester, with the government not knowing who he is or where he is. The whole point of this scene right now is that the CIA does not know Charles Xavier. He worked for them. He was on their payroll. Rose Byrne says, they can threaten me all they want, but I'll never tell them where you are. Never. He's at his childhood home. That's like the first place they would look. An enormous mansion, too. 
Like, it's not like this place is not going to like fly under the. You can see this fucking house from space. Yeah. He went to the CIA and gave a PowerPoint presentation. They know where this dude lives. This is an unbelievably weird scene. This actually, this scene, this is the scene that's a problem for me, ultimately. The very last scene. It's just like, how did you get from the Bahamas to Westchester with a seriously wounded man who cannot walk and a fuzzy blue dude and a, an active CIA agent who is responsible for this insane international crisis? How did they get here? How did they get here? I don't know. There's a very gritty telling of this story where it's like Charles got shot. And then like the only reason he lost his legs because he had to be underground and he couldn't get medical help. But no, he's got like the Mercedes Benz of wheelchairs. He has a really nice wheelchair. Yeah. This actually, this is the same as at the end of Man of, Man of Steel is the same thing. Everybody knows that Superman is Clark Kent. The government has been to his house. They've been to his mom's house. And they, but they do a whole thing about how like, he's not going to tell the government where he is. And they have forgotten, just like, just like they have forgotten. The government really needs to keep better track of the most dangerous people in the world. They have a hard time with that. The real problem, the real concern here is that Moira might tell them something. And so he kisses her and then he rapes her so hard that she loses time. After she does, like, probably the most important thing in X-Men lore, she names the X-Men. That's true. She's done a lot. Yeah. When Charles was in trouble, she's the one person who came and helped. All of his little friends just stood there and watched. This movie almost gives her a satisfying story from start to finish, but... Oh, and then, but they, what they do to her, what they do to her in this scene, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want them to do to anybody. She is back in... The, a CIA room with a whole bunch of important men. And she's like, I don't really know what happened. All of a sudden, she's like, she's not like the fun, like, I'm going to go infiltrate something. No, she's like, I woke up at home and I remember trees and sunlight and a kiss. And the guy fucking says, gentlemen, this is why the CIA is no place for a woman. Fucking shit. You know, this this movie has a horrible track record of misogyny. So just one more from the road. And the thing is, like, and you could say that it's showing that they're wrong, but there's no alternative worldview. That's the last line of that scene. That's what we're left with. Yeah, this movie tries to, like, have its cake and eat it, too, in terms of, like, weren't the 60s terrible? But, like, also, can't we go back to the 60s? It was great. This is Yeah, this is a problem, is that, like, a movie that takes place in 1962, it doesn't mean... That you have to make it feel like it was made in 1962. Yeah. Back to the typing pool for Moira. Mm -hmm. And then Emma, who, as we have all forgotten about her since Act 2, she hasn't been in this movie at all. She's just been sitting around in a CIA lockbox. And so Eric comes and gets her. He has a cape on now. Because he is just completely embracing the fact that he is the evil man. And he's got his helmet. And his helmet is like a devil skull now. So he's got like a big cape. He's just a super villain man now. And I'm looking at his like scary skull helmet. And I'm like, well, how dare those humans hate and fear you? <laughs> Dummies. He was wearing all of those super tight turtlenecks and all those form-fitting three-piece suits. And so now he's just... He's dressing for comfort. It's just flowy. <laughs> it's a different look for sure, but, you know, yeah. he's living his best life. He is. And that's the end of X-Men First Class. It is such a weird movie. Yeah, and that is actually the end. That's that's the final scene, and then the movie is over. And I just I watched all of the credits because I have been trained over the past decade that you watch all of the credits. No, that didn't. That was not yet. And yeah, I mean, that was a beautiful time. You could just like, he says, I prefer Magneto. And then you just walk out of the theater. That's it. You don't have to sit through five minutes of CG special effects. Art. Right, all this the VFX people. 2011, it was a golden age when we didn't have to watch superhero movie credits. So what they do with Charles and Eric, I think is fantastic. Everything serves them. They get lots of good emotional confrontations, but basically short changes everybody else. And all of the story threads around it are just illogical and insane. And that shouldn't bother me, but there aren't enough hot people in this movie to distract me. That is actually my problem. I'm waiting until 2012 when everybody takes their shirts off. And then I stop caring about all of the illogical plot threads. 
All right. Uh, I mean, I'll give you that. But the real question is, which of us is a secret Nazi? Between you and me? Mm -hmm. Not it. Ah, shit. Put my finger on my nose. Uh, Sorry, dude. Secret Nazi. Okay. <laughs> you you know what? You're accepting it with class. And I and I yeah. I respect that. If it means that I get to wear some very well cut three piece suits, drink some you got them. Some cocktails, shove a coin through somebody's head every now and then. As long as I get to kill someone with a coin. Yeah. I'll be fine. I'll do it. For more comedy about the history of superhero movies, go to the blog at superheroeseveryday.com. If you like the show, please leave a review or you could reach me on Twitter, on Facebook or on the blog. It would be great to hear from you. And please tell the people in your life about the show. I think they deserve it. And a big thank you to Richard Gomez, who made the beautiful logo for this podcast. You can find Richard on Twitter at Starman's Art. That's S-T-A-R-M-A-N-S-A-R-T. Go check him out. He's fantastic. And I am so happy with this logo. I cannot even tell you. Thank you, Richard. And speaking of things that I love, coming up in the next episode, we are discussing Shaquille O'Neal's 1997 Superman-adjacent box office bomb. That's right, we're talking steel. Shaq was a, a famous basketball player, and as an actor, he is a very good basketball player. I, I have a theory that is not a generous theory towards Kenneth Johnson or, or Warner Brothers. Yeah, I believe I'm about to have the same theory. Burke says, how would you like to help me deal the next generation of super weapons? And it's like, well, I work in an arcade, so... She says, should you be in school? And he says, well, why learn when you can earn? Firepower, kid! That's what we're talking about! Yeah! Yeah, boy. firepower, kid! <laughs> Just giving guns out to at-risk youth, putting them even more at risk. Yeah! He's taking her out of here! She doesn't get to finish rehab! Like, <laughs> yeah! <laughs> All right, so come back for more fun. Trevor, thank you so much for being on the show. Well, thanks for having me. Come back for more from the Superheroes Everyday Podcast. Thank you for listening. Love you. Bye.